my thought process went to a dark place where I thought, well, I've got a wife who's only 30, I've got three young kids. The best thing I can do is kill myself so that they don't have to have an invalid that they have to worry about for the next 40 or 50 years. And so I went to a place to do that. And as I was about to do it, a thought came to me that said, no, you don't have to do this. You can choose to live and you can choose to heal and you can push back on the labels and you can be a voice for others to give them hope that they can heal as well. Well, hello and welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Finding Equilibrium show. Delighted to be here, delighted that you're here and delighted that my guest today is Paul Calican. Paul is an Aboriginal person from Warimai country and he's also an educator, a teacher uh, and an author and he's recently written a brilliant book called The Dreaming Path. Now I've read this book and today we're going to dig into some of uh, some of the ideas and the concepts but effectively in an age where there's so much change and so much um, um, chaos and I think we're all feeling it, it's nice to to, to to learn from the past and see how some of those ideas can really help us with our well-being today. So, Paul, welcome. It's so wonderful to see you again. Thank you very much for, for spending some time with us. And where are you today? Good morning, Lawrence. Good morning, audience. I am sitting in my office in a beautiful part of country called Old Bar, which is on the coast from Tari, about four hours north of, of Sydney. And it's my traditional country from my grandfather's people, the Viripai people. So I'm connected to this country and I walk the beach every day and I paddleboard quite often and connect with country. And that gives me so much balance that I can do just about anything pretty much. <laughs> That's wonderful to hear. So, so, so for people who haven't read your book yet, um, I'd love to understand a little bit more about your journey to writing that book, um, because you've done a number of different things, and um, I'd love um, you to share a little bit about your journey to this point. I have done a number of things, and they've all led me to this point in life, which is a wonderful, wonderful privilege for me. So I've run big organisation. So I was a CEO of an institute of TAFE where I had a $60 million budget and 1,200 staff and 23,000 students and 80 dreaded key performance indicators that I had to, to meet. And the last 10 years, I've run my own business as a consultant where I can really provide fine-tuned value to organisations and companies about improving service delivery to Aboriginal people. But in that time, I decided I would complete a PhD, which I've done, and I also wrote this book, The Dreaming Path. And where the book came from to start with is I've been very involved in the Western education system. So I've got a diploma in drafting, I've got a diploma in surveying, I've got a Bachelor of Commerce, I've got a certificate for in training, I've got postgrad qualifications in governance, in leadership, in executive coaching and emotional intelligence as well as my PhD, but the greatest learning I've done is over 20 years going bush with elders. And my going bush with elders, it saved my life and it gave me life because in my mid thirties, I suffered a nervous breakdown. I had acute depression, acute anxiety. I was agoraphobic, I was locked up. I locked myself up in my house and I couldn't leave for months. When I reached out to the medical system, the system told me that I wouldn't be able to heal. And so my thought process went to a dark place where I thought, well, I've got a wife who's only 30, I've got three young kids. The best thing I can do is kill myself so that they don't have to have an invalid that they have to worry about for the next 40 or 50 years. And so I went to a place to do that. And as I was about to do it, a thought came to me that said, no, you don't have to do this. You can choose to live and you can choose to heal and you can push back on the labels and you can be a voice for others to give them hope that they can heal as well. And so I made a decision to do that. And then not too long after that was when an, an elder invited me bush. And that was a shock because I'd been told culture doesn't exist on the East Coast of Australia but I could promise you it does and it's alive and it's, it's very rich and it's very beautiful. So I was 
given access to that learning and it changed my life and it gave me all sorts of opportunities and part of my journey was trying to become or trying to get back to the old me but what happened and I can promise this for everybody once you still once you start really thinking about your life not only will you get back to the old you you'll surpass that and you'll become the real you and I became the real me and I fully embraced the real me warts and all I love the real me I love the footsteps I walk and a few years ago I said to Uncle Paul Gordon who's been a, a major influence in my life an elder with knowledge that's just beyond anything that I've ever encountered with anybody else I said the things that that I've been given and taught can we put that in the book and he said yeah why not the world needs to listen to this stuff and that's where the book came from wow uh, amazing so I'd love to dig a little bit more about what going uh, going going to bush really looks like like what actually happens you know a lot of people listening to this would be outside of australia um, and it would be great to um, to give them an understanding of you know of what really happened to you because clearly you uh, you're uh, you know on your knees at one point you know as low as you can get and um, and then this yes. saved you this saved you and i'd love to really understand what was it that inspired you in such a way so when we go bush it's not it's not the equivalent of a walk in the forest it's not that at all so if you think about learning paradigms most of us learn in different kinds of institutions inside four walls and there's nothing wrong with that that's that's an opportunity to to share knowledge and to grow knowledge when we talk about going bush it, it's our place of learning but it's far more than that because in our culture in our spirituality there's a big creation story about how the mother was born of the water so in our big creation story there was a ball of water and underneath that was the earth and then the earth rose and the waters burst and the mother was born and then there's a big story about how the mother gave birth to all living things the plants the trees the, the dolphins the fish the furred creatures the winged creatures everything and that story says that we belong to the mother and the mother loves us and she'll never turn on us and she'll always remember us because we're her children, including people we were born last. It also tells us that when we go bush, we're surrounded by family and so we never need to feel alone. And the reason why humans were the last born were, was to remind us that we're the youngest, we're the siblings, we're the babies and to always remember that everything around us when we go into country or the bush or the land are our elders and our teachers. And so if we go and sit and be still and just go within, we will find wisdom beyond anything we thought we could ever hear. And it comes from that which is around us. And I've done that many times. It's a wonderful thing to do to go and sit and be still in your favourite place, but not for three minutes. Go and sit for half a day and just free yourself up and when you do, you'll find that you'll be inspired. So going bush is about going and sitting down in these places and embracing that stillness. And so the Aboriginal world is really framed around stillness and quiet, not noise. The Western world is all about noise. We have noise all around us. We have noise in terms of our mental acuity. We've got lots of things in our head all the time. And we always feel the need to talk all the time whereas Aboriginal people are very comfortable with silence and space and stillness. So when you find this place of stillness and go inward, that's when you can start unpacking a lot of the, a lot of the noise that's been put into our heads from when we're young that really takes us away from our true self. So that's part of going bush, but going bush is also being with other people and sharing laughter and sharing friendship and sharing spirit and saying I'm here for you I've got your back we're here together and so we can talk about just everyday things and problems mm -hmm. going bush is also about going to places where there's big story and we'll get told a story and we'll say this place teaches us not to be greedy this place teaches us to always give this place teaches us to be loving this place teaches us to share this place here teaches us to be respectful so Key cornerstones of, of our culture are the values of love, respect, humility, and always share. And there are big sites and they can be artworks or they can be engravings or they can be entire mountain ranges because our stories are in the land everywhere and people might go, well, that's really cool. I'll have to go there every day, but our stories are also in the stars at night. So in our world, when we go bush, it's a metaphor 
for connecting with all that is around us, including the sky, including the waters, including the land itself. Because when we connect with those things, we're connecting with our infinite self and we can connect with who we really are. And I don't expect people to believe all of that in terms of, of their spirituality. This isn't about convincing people to convert. This is about understanding what we believe in and the values of those practices and going and following those practices and seeing what it gives them. And sitting in the bush, I can promise anyone that does it will give them insights and peace that maybe they've been searching for for a very long time. I love that. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that with me. I mean, there are lots of comparisons between the, um, the Aboriginal way of being, if you like, and the Western way of being. And the book does a brilliant job at really highlighting that. And I really like the way that there's your voice and, um, and um, Uncle Paul Gordon's voice together that really kind of highlights those things. But I'd love you to kind of highlight because it, it's interesting when, when I read the book, it connected with me at a very deep level because it talked about leadership it talked about mentorship it talked about um, the importance of the environment and really appreciating and understanding uh, your environment not taking anything uh, without replacing it so quite different in many ways to um, to the way we, we think and the way we behave in the west although that is um, that is changing but I'd love you to highlight where potentially we could learn from Aboriginal culture um, in, in the West and build this bridge because uh, what you just said I think is very accurate it's not about abandoning one way and going to a completely different way but it's about taking some of those practices and really applying them into our life that can help us uh, find uh, find equilibrium thanks Lawrence that's that's a really wonderful opening for me to to really talk about how we do bring the two worlds together because we are in a Western world that's dominated by all sorts of things. And, mm. and it's not all negative. There's lots of really, really good things. I mean, hot water on a cold morning is really nice. Being able to travel and visit friends and loved ones in my car is really nice. Being able to talk to people on the phone, being able to talk to you today and reach out to an audience, wonderful things. But in that, in that maze, there are lots of things that take us away from who we really are. And so this is why it's important when we're going forward to not forget where we've been. And we've all been somewhere in terms of our journey as humans. We're all indigenous from somewhere. And indigenous wisdom, there's a lot of universality right across the world for us to embrace. And there's a lot of commonality. And so my job is to try and bring all that together. So there's a saying the old people have that's really powerful in terms of how do you find meaning from the world's oldest living culture in this Western world and, and non-Aboriginal people included. And the saying is, when we leave this world behind, all we leave behind is our story. So make it the best story possible. And so every one of us has a story. And the unfortunate reality of what I see in dominant culture is we kind of look back at our story with a negative bias because our brain's a bit wired that way and society's a bit that way where we have regrets and we look at the things we kind of missed out on rather than feeling good about our story. And every single person, if I could meet them and sit down and have a coffee, and get them to share their story, I would find something inspiring about them and their story. And to start with, the chances of being born is one in six with 100 zeros after it. Wow. So the chances of being born is impossible statistically. So we're born for a reason, our spirituality says that. And the reason is to live a good story. Most people I observe, they, they equate a busy story to a good story and it's not. They go into a workplace and they get really stressed and stress becomes the norm. And it almost becomes a competition of who can be the, the most anxious and stressed and going home and wound up. That's not leading a good story. That's not to say work is not important. It's important, but it's part of who we are. It's not who we are, which is the importance of, of defining who we are and our balance and where does your work fit into that. And so leading a good story is about embracing colour. And I call the opposite to that are the greys. And I see grey people everywhere. They live in a monotone. They're not happy, they're not contented, and they're kind of going through the motions, waiting until they retire when they can finally find colour, and then they don't know what colour looks like and they miss out. The challenge is to find the colour in every day, and it's there. So live a really good story. It's powerful, and the platform of that in our way is what we call in the Western world the law, capital L-O-R-E, the law. 
And the law is our ontology or value systems and, and the guiding principles of how we live our life. In our way, the word in our language is called the Yurumpa. And the Yurumpa in English says, I am born to care for my place and all things in my place. Now that might sound like autocratic, but it's not. It says, we are here to care for our place, the earth and all things in our place. That's all our brothers and sisters around us, including each other. But how we do that is different with all of us. So some of us might be radio producers, some of us might be cooks, some of us might be teachers, but we all do our stuff with the same purpose and that is to come together and care for our place and each other. And if you think about that as a world, as a global entity, think what a great world we would have if every one of us was wired to think, okay, I'm doing my stuff today and it's great. And I'm doing it in a way that I care for my place and all things in my place. That's what I'm doing. How good would that be? And so that's the thing for people to think about with their work and with what they do outside work. How do I care for my place and all things in my place? in a way that's loving, sharing, respectful and giving. And you'll find if you do that, you're then on the dreaming path and you're on a path to contentment because those things are what give us true meaning and purpose. Whereas a lot of us, when we get consumed by the workplace, we try to be all things to all people at all times. And that's why I had my breakdown. And then we lose track of our footsteps. So what's the most important part of all of what I've just said? We are born to walk our footsteps, our story and all of us, have a story that's slightly different, but we all walk together beside each other. There's no one in front, there's no one behind, we're together. But the challenge is to say, am I walking my footsteps? What are my footsteps? And that can be a bit scary when you grow up in a school system that tells you what those footsteps would be. Mm -hmm. And then you go into education that tells you what those footsteps should be. And then you work in an environment where you're told what your footsteps should be. And if we're not careful, we rush ourselves to the grave with regret. Very, uh, very profound. Um, thank you for sharing that with me. When I listen to you speak, I'm thinking about our audience because often we hear words like like you share and it all makes perfect sense and it and it forces us to look into the mirror of truth and look at our own life and think you know am i living uh, my dreaming path or how far away am i from from my, my dreaming path and then we say well yes but we've got to earn money we've got to pay the bills we've got to buy all these things um, and convenience is really important i don't have time for all of these things so how would you or aboriginal people really respond to someone who says yes but you know yes but we need you know we need money we need uh, there's never enough time how do you know how do we break that cycle how do we shift so that we can move closer to the um to the dreaming path which i don't think anyone listening to this is going to say they don't want to be on and um, you know honestly i think we all want the dreaming path and we all have a intuitive need to care for our environment and we know that if we destroy our environment we're destroying ourselves you know an intuitive level we we know that and yet we feel that we're in this cycle of um of disrupt of destruction in many ways that um we can't we can't get off and um, i'd love to um to get your perspective on um on the transition how do we yep. begin to change i guess is um, is behind yep. the question well the first step is to to have a look at what you're doing and say what is it do i really want to do in my life and the way to look at that is when i'm 100 years old how do i want people to describe me do i want my headstone to say i had more back-to-back -back meetings than anybody <laughs> and that i was more stressed than anybody no most people would say i want to be known as generous kind caring considered and was always there for those that needed me and i made a difference that's pretty universal with all of us. So to be, to be, what's the word? To challenge people, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to, to think of here. We need to challenge ourselves and say, okay, it's easy to throw my hands up and say it's all too hard and I'm too busy, but busyness for many of us is a bad habit. So it's about reframing our attitude because the big word in Aboriginal culture that relates to this is responsibility. So for 100,000 years, we always have responsibilities. We, we had a life of contentment for a long time, but we still had responsibilities. We had responsibilities for each other. We had responsibilities to our children. We had responsibilities to find food and to build houses and to travel country and to do ceremony. So nothing's changed. It's 
just that the context is different. So all of us have a responsibility now to still care for each other and families. And it just so happens we have to work to earn money to do that because we've created that kind of environment around us. So it's not a, it's not a dirty thing. It's not a bad thing to say, I need to work. There's nothing to feel guilty about. It's about reframing, and reframing that and saying, okay, I have to work and I have to do other things, but what are my responsibilities at a broader level? Yes, my responsibility is to bring in income, but I also have a responsibility for my family. So I need to spend time with them as well. I also have a responsibility for my community. I also have a responsibility for caring for the environment. And the really big one that I can promise a lot of your audience don't think about is I have a responsibility to care for myself and to walk my footsteps. That's a sacred responsibility. That's why you're here. And so the first part of giving is to give to yourself. And some people will say, but aren't I being selfish? No, you're being selfless because by giving to yourself, that means you have more capacity to give to others. And if you follow my footsteps, which I suggest nobody does, and you try and do everything to keep everybody happy, and you eventually have a breakdown, then those that you love become quite worried. And when you contemplate suicide, and if anyone's triggered, please get help. There are a lot of people that are stressed. And if you do kill yourself, there are a lot of people that grieve for the rest of their life. So being what you might call selfish and looking after yourself, is actually a sacred responsibility of saying, who am I and how do I juggle all these things? So you almost have to be quite analytical about it. Even though I talk about spirituality and flowing and you'll be taken to the right place and I believe that, it's almost like a contradiction. You also need to be sitting down and analytical and going, what are my responsibilities and how do I manage that? So at work, we manage our workload. We sit down, usually we plan, we diarize, we unpack, we go, here we are, that's what I need to do, here are my outcomes. You almost need to do the same with your life and have a monthly planner where you say, where is my planned celebration? Where is my planned time out? Where is my planned time for spirituality? Where is my planned time for connecting with country? Here's my bit about work, but where are all the other bits for my family? And you have to plan it so that you can be disciplined about it. And if you do it for long enough, then you will find that it becomes a habit and then it becomes the norm and it's not a big deal. But you raise an interesting thing about time. In the Aboriginal world, we don't have a concept of time. We call it every when. Past, present and future is the same thing. And we were governed in terms of the big boss by the heartbeat of Mother Earth. She told us where the foods were at certain times of the year. The sun told us, the seasons told us. In the Western world, the big boss that controls everybody is the clock. From the minute before you wake up, you're kind of thinking about it. And then the alarm goes or you wake up and you go, oh my gosh, I've got a rush. And then you're rushing into work and then you've got all the stresses of work saying, I haven't got time to do all this. Then you rush home or you might rush to the gym or you might rush to cook food or you might rush to do something with the kids. And you're going, oh my God, oh my God, I can't wait for the, wait for the weekend where I've got some time. And then you get to the weekend and you haven't got enough time. And that's why I say you rush yourself to the grave. Mm -hmm. Instead of time being the boss of you, the challenge is for every one of us to be the boss of time. And I'm leaving proof that you can do that. I run a a very busy consultancy. I've just finished a PhD. I've just written another book. But I always, I don't, I wouldn't say I've always got time, but I use my time really well. And so I don't waste it. And when I say wasting time, I have downtime. I paddleboard every couple of days. I walk the beach every day. I love bars. I go to the movies. I watch my favorite shows on Netflix and, and other streaming channels. So downtime is part of me time that is time I use. So I'm not always on the move. I balance those things. Now that's really, um, that, that's really useful um, to, to hear because time in my work is always the big barrier that people say there's just not enough time. And uh, in many ways, what you describe is almost turning everything on its head. Um, because if you prioritize yourself first, then that, all, that gives you more energy, that gives you more capacity to have more time to do all the things that you really want. But you do need these skills around planning and, um, and organizing. Um, and I really like this concept about rushing rush into the grave I and mean, then that's not a particularly pleasant uh, pleasant thought to, to actually have what else are, uh, are different about or what else can we learn from aboriginal culture i think one of the big things that stood out for me when i read that when i read the book i mean you've touched it already um 
but the importance of knowledge and that responsibility of sharing knowledge, you know, I'd never thought about it in the way that if you have knowledge, then it's your responsibility to share that and to, um, and, and to guide younger generations. I guess when you look at the Western um, cultures that, that, that we're part of, um, it almost feels that we don't have this concept of elders anymore, that, the, um, uh, that as, you, um, as you get older in Western culture, it's something to fear rather than something to uh, embrace. And we tend to celebrate, you know, youth and, um, and um, you know, and being, and being young. Um, I'd love to, to get your views on the importance of knowledge, the importance of sharing, and also the importance of, you know, respecting those elders in our society and their role that they, uh, that they play, because it's a fundamental role in ab Aboriginal uh, culture. Yeah, great, great thoughts. So if you look at the cover of my book, you'll find it has a, an image, of, a very light image of circle upon circle upon circle. Like as if you're throwing a pebble in the water and you've got all those concentric circles. That is the depiction of the Nuremberg in terms of what it looks like when we tell story. And there are engravings and drawings of circle upon circle throughout Australia because we had over 500 languages and we've got a lot of diversity, but underpinning the diversity is the one law, which is I care for my place. Each of those circles represents or is a metaphor for, for story, which is a metaphor for knowledge. So our law, which is everything we build on, is literally thousands of circles and every circle is a layer of knowledge of which we are given as we grow from childhood. So knowledge is the greatest gift and the old people say, knowledge if not shared is of no use to anybody and has no power. So we need to share knowledge. So intellectual property, that gives you a competitive advantage in the business environment, of course, but there's also stuff we need to share. And so it appalls me that we have all these, these imposts and barriers where we have to pay to go to uni and TAFE and all these places because knowledge is a gift that keeps on giving and it gives an ROI, return on investment over five to $6 per dollar put into it to start with. So knowledge needs to be shared and the storms of our life, when we go through hardship and we all encounter them, you can't stop a storm from coming, but a storm will always pass and we've all been through lots of storms. So the old people say, face the storm and embrace it because when the storm comes, they say, oh, that's good. And you go, what's so good about that? And I'll say, oh, because you're ready for it. The spirits know that you're ready for this challenge because you're ready for learning and growth. And so the storms, the hard times, if we face them properly, are our chance to reflect and learn and grow. And then we're ready for our next phase of life. And so as we grow older, we grow wiser. And this is a big problem in the world. In 1900, the knowledge in the world doubled every 100 years. In 1945, it was every 25 years. Right now, it's every 12 hours. Wow. So there's more knowledge in the world than ever now, but there's no wisdom because we don't spend time converting it. And so there's a, there's a desert of wisdom and there's an overabundance and flood of knowledge. And the two aren't kind of being converted. So we need to think about that. So the definition of an elder is a person who has accrued knowledge and uses that knowledge to lift those around them in a positive way. That's an elder. And it's a blessing to grow old. And so traditionally, we had lots of elders because they all accrued knowledge and they would give. And I'm in a really fortunate place now with, I, I mentor hundreds of men in my own time. And it would be lovely if governments funded this kind of stuff, but they don't. But they call me now the old fella. And so for a Western person, they go, oh, that's a bit cheeky, call me the old fella. But they, the Aboriginal world being called old fella is a sign of respect. They say, oh, yeah, old fella. And they mean by saying that it's a term of love, it's a term of endearment, and it's a term of respect saying we acknowledge that you have learned things and that we can come and sit with you. And so elders are the greatest resource. And there's a television show on the ABC right now where there's old people in a home and teenagers. And it follows on from a show last year where the old people were connecting with, with the little ones. And that's the kind of thing we need to be recreating in communities where old people and younger people are coming together and we're sharing story. And the way we share knowledge is through story. We tell yarns. I would say that I'm primarily a storyteller. In everything I do, I, I talk story. When I was a CEO of a big business, most people 
thought it was okay. A few people would roll their eyes and say, here's Paul telling another story. But that's the way we learn. We learn through story. So knowledge is the most beautiful thing we can share, but even better when we can use the knowledge we've been given and then walk a walk where we're actually then actioning wisdom. And the older we get, the more wisdom we accumulate if we're open to learning and growing. A lot of people shut that down. A lot of people don't grow because they're too busy being busy and they're missing all the opportunities to learn. Hence the importance of taking time out. Hence the importance, if you create a learning plan, don't just look at what you need to learn for your business. Need to learn, look at what you need to learn for you. It could be cooking, it could be music, it could be meditation, it could be all sorts of things. Mm. They're all wonderful things. Mm. No, I, I, I love that. One last um, area, I feel I could ask you so many questions, but I, I, I'm, I'm aware of time. But the word that you've used a few times, which I, I think is such an important word, is community. Um, and community is something which, you know, we hear a lot uh, about its importance, but we also see um, that many, many people are, are, are feeling increasingly isolated and lonely and not connected to a community. And it strikes me that workplaces could be communities and um, because ultimately we come together and uh, i'd love your thoughts on um on community and how can we um or how can we learn from aboriginal people in terms of how to really uh, nurture and support communities so that they support um you know they, they support uh, all of us um, as we uh, as we you know go through our day-to-day -day lives well, the term community, when you unpack it, it's com, which is communications and it's unity. So how do we communicate in unity? So straight away, that tells us let's come together. And if you think about the neural power, I care for my place and all things in my place. So I must always care for those around me. So community from an Aboriginal perspective is everywhere. So when I walk out in the bush, I'm surrounded by my family. That's my community. When I'm living in, in a Western suburb or town, that's where I live. And they're all my people that I see in the shops. They're my community. When I'm working with people, they're my community too. So there's different communities. And it's really important to treasure and respect those that are around us. So that's about sharing story. And there are two big R words in, in Aboriginal law. There's the responsibility one I've just told you, but the other one is relationships. And so the research on value systems, Western versus Aboriginal, is quite clear. The Western world values materialism and power and prestige. And that's what people aspire to. The Aboriginal world, our source of contentment is the richness of our relationships with each other and with country. So that's community, that's building relationships. So in the workplace, we need to have the time to build relationships. And I know it's not about all becoming besties, but we do need to build relationships because that's how we keep an eye out for each other and make sure that we're all well. Because in the definition of well-being from an Aboriginal perspective compared to a Western world, Western world definition is a lack of symptoms. Aboriginal definition of well-being is I must be well mind, body and spirit and so must everybody else around me, including country. And so that includes non-Aboriginal people. And so this is one of the reasons I wrote the book. We all that live on this country, we're all part of this country, we're all part of the mother and she knows us all. So we are all able to connect with her and love her just like Aboriginal people do. I have no more rights to it than other people but I have the knowledge to share so that people know how to connect with the mother and feel part of her too. So with the book, part of it, in addition to tips for wellbeing for the individual is about how we can all come together in love country and sit in the one circle. And circles are really important because they have no start, no end. We can see each other. We can be vulnerable knowing that we can trust each other. And so there's no ego and we care for each other. So my, my vision is for us all to be one in this country and to care for each other, including in the workplace, where we do have a sense of community. And so rather than, it's funny that the Western world is really big on noise, but when it comes to sharing story, it goes silent. It's kind of really, it, 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 it connects at a very superficial level or a very task-based level and doesn't dig deep into who are you and who am I and how are we connected. It doesn't find that universality it doesn't find that global strategic connectivity that underpins us all. And that's where the law is so important. We're all one. How we do that is different. So diversity is certainly beautiful, but the diversity is underpinned 
by unity. And that then ties into community. I love that. Thank you very much for sharing um, with us. So I'm conscious of time now. So the last question, something I ask all of my guests, and I feel we've covered this, but I'll ask it anyway. So this uh, this show is called the Finding Equilibrium Show. Uh, you know, and the the real essence of that is that when we're in balance, then we can be our best self. We can move in um, in in a flow state. But from your point of view, what does finding equilibrium mean to you? Finding equilibrium, first of all, there's, there's a, an acronym I use to describe the key elements of, of Aboriginal culture. And this has come to me since I've written the book because people were asking me, what's the essence of contentment from an Aboriginal perspective? And so it's an acronym that you can remember by remember fast moving bugs. So remember, just think about a heap of cockroaches running around on the floor and you'll go, ew, that's fast moving bugs. So F stands for, for flow. And you've mentioned that several times, Lawrence. So, we need to flow, not fight. M stands for mindfulness. So we need to live in the now, not get caught up in the when then syndrome of the future or looking back at the past with regret. So be mindful. And then B is balance, FMB. Oh, wow. And so balance is really important in everything you do, find balance, balance in your life, not work-life balance, that's 50-50, that's wrong. Works maybe 25% of your balance. You know, Think about the other things. U stands for unity. So in all that you do, create unity, not not disunity or marginalization. G stands for gratitude. So every day have gratitude for what you have rather than feeling lost about what you don't have. And S stands for story. Remember your story, but those around you. So how do I find balance? I find balance by keeping an eye on myself and going, okay, how am I feeling today? If I'm feeling a bit stressed or stretched, I go, okay, why? Am I out of balance? Yes, okay. Is that a temporary thing or am I now creating a bad habit? Bad habit, need to fix it. Temporary thing, that's okay. I'm going to do something tomorrow to reward myself for being out of balance and then I'll rebalance. But how do I find my balance? The most important thing, connect with country every day in some way. Whether it's standing out the back, it's hard in the city to look at the stars, looking at the stars. Or take your shoes off and go out in your backyard or somewhere and wriggle your feet in the sand or the grass or the dirt and go, wow, this country gives me everything and I love it. And so... That's where I find my balance, and my balance is through doing things mind, body, and spirit. So I try and eat relatively well, but I'll still have naughty days. I'll do things in terms of my mind that's connecting to country, but also meditate and, and things in the book. I've got some different exercises there for people to do. But I also have my spiritual beliefs where I just trust that everything's going the way it's meant to be. And so I, because I follow those practices 24 seven. I've always got balance, even though some people look at my life and go, wow, that's a whirlwind of busyness. You're not following, you're not talking what you're, you're not following or walking what you're talking. And I say, no, I'm, I'm, even though it looks like I'm really busy, you don't see the balance and I've got all the other bits. I mean, my bathtub and I are really great mates. So I sit down and I play Tony O kind of bird music every couple of nights and space out with um, essential oils because that helps give me balance. So mm. we're all different. And so it's about, and this is one of the problems, we compare ourselves to other people all the time and get ourselves hoodwinked. Finding our footsteps and finding balance, it's about gathering this knowledge and going, okay, what does this mean for me? So some people can live a, a life, for, I'm gonna talk old school now, when you had a record that was 78 RPMs where it would go really quick. And other people are happy at 33 RPMs, which is how the LPs used to be. So we're all a little bit different. And that's what makes it so beautiful in this world. Every one of us, when we come together and join like a jigsaw, we create this beautiful tapestry when we start to connect. And so that's about understanding that we are all unique and we all have a special story. And so finding that balance is different, but you need to read up and get your knowledge on it. It's not gonna just fall out of the sky. You need to read. So I've read lots of self-help books. People criticize self-help books. I love them because they give me fuel for thought. And then I extract what works for me. So this book is an amalgam of hundreds of books I've read, plus what the old people have taught me. And so it's enabled me to create who I am and how I find balance. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. I mean, just to summarize, it's like a lot of people think uh, well-being, true well-being is the result of one thing, but as you've um, you know, so eloquently described, it's multiple things and that are unique. 
for you as an individual. So, yeah. so invest the time to get the knowledge and then with that knowledge, um, integrate the tools or whatever practices and habits that really help you find equilibrium. Thank yeah, you so much, Paul. So Paul, it's been an absolute honor. Let me just take a moment to uh, acknowledge you for like all the work you do. It's incredible. And the book, um, I believe, is is a book that everybody should read. And I don't say that um, too, um, uh, too, too often, I, I can assure you. I mean, it really has, in my mind, made something which has been practiced for thousands of years um, accessible to us in our modern uh, in our modern day at a time when we are all going through huge change and we're looking more people i believe are open to new ideas because the old um, rule book is not going to serve us into in, in the future and the new rule book hasn't yet been written but i think what's empowering uh, from this conversation is that we can write that rule book together and be guided by you know aboriginal and traditional um uh, to traditional culture which has been there so it's not like brand new we can just um you know look to the future by looking to the past so thank you so much for um spending time with us and um uh, any 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 last words where where can people find um out more about you and your work um and uh uh, and, and for you yeah if you if you just google my name paul calligan aboriginal my website will come up with my consultancy work also i'm on linkedin i'm on facebook so you can track me down those ways and the book itself it's available in most bookstores quite often it, there's a big run and it will sell out so another alternative is through booktopia itself it's about to go worldwide, which is quite exciting. And it's also in an audio form for those that like to listen as they're driving to different places. So I, I feel privileged to be able to share this. And certainly when people reach out, usually through LinkedIn and, and send me a message, I feel really touched that they would take the time to do that because this isn't about me, it's about the message within. And it's nice to know that there are people that are listening to these messages and it's helping them live a better life of contentment rather than chasing happiness, which we can't have all the time, but we can certainly be accepting and, and find a place of contentment, which I'm a living proof of that. I love that. Thank you so much, Paul. And thank you everyone for, for listening and for your attention. And we will see you next time. Thanks so much.